they see headlines, they see what's taking place and have no real understanding of variants, the market, sealed game rarity, anything like that. And a lot of new people come in and it's super easy to dismiss the whole market as stupid, fake, bullshit, whatever. Um, that's not to say that, you know, what Carl is about to say in this video might not be true or whatever. I know there's bullshit manipulation and all that other stuff, but um, I'm really interested to see what Carl has to say. Let's put it that way. I think we're good to start. So um, sit back, let's get comfy and I'll try to pause the video in the most logical places to add commentary. If I talk over the video too much, sorry. Let's get into this. You absolute legends. In 2017, the most expensive video game ever sold cost $30,000. It was a mint condition, sealed copy of the original Super Mario Brothers. In 2021, the most expensive video game ever bought cost $2 million. But this was a very special game. Oh, actually, it was the same game. That's an increase of over 6,000% for the same game in just four years. Something very strange is happening in the world of video game collecting. Headlines are flooding the internet, describing new records set for insane prices. But this is an extremely recent phenomenon, and one that seems to have arisen overnight. For the past several decades, video game collecting has honestly been pretty niche. Truly dedicated collectors seemed to be few and far between, and even if they did amass a respectable collection, there was little fame to be gathered from it. In contrast to something like the art world where collectors represent the richest of society, flaunting their lavish purchases, video game collecting was mostly done by the purest of heart. Regular gamers, nerds in the truest sense, who were just so passionate about the hobby that they were happy to spend whatever spare cash they could scramble together to acquire a cart here or there, often as cheaply as they possibly could. Video game collectors weren't rich, but they didn't need to be either. Retro video games were never that expensive, therefore basically anyone could do it. And that was one of the great things about it. All you really needed was passion and time. But in 2018, something happened that would change everything. The launch of a company called Wata Games. This was no ordinary launch, and Wata is no ordinary company. There is a select group of very wealthy, very powerful people who are pulling the strings behind this recent spike in video game prices. And those same people are making money hand over fist. When I heard the news of a $1.5 million Super Mario 64, this seemed too ridiculous for me to ignore. I knew there had to be more to this story than meets the eye, and boy, was I not wrong. This rabbit hole is deep. The bubble we are seeing in video games has been seen before in other collectibles for almost half a century. And the crazy thing is that each time it happens, the same people are involved. They know exactly what they are doing, and they know how to extract as much money as possible from suckers who believe the headlines. There is a lot of shady stuff going on, and you won't believe what I've found. This entire situation is fraught with unethical business practices, deception, collusion, and even fraud. By the end of this video, you will know exactly why this is happening, who is causing it to happen, and what needs to be done to stop it. I really hope you enjoy. So there's your skinny on what this video is going to go over. Like, you know, the video game collecting hobby has been two separate hobbies for a very long time. I know for a lot of people, they're just figuring out or finding out about the whole sealed graded games market, but this has been a, what do you want to call it? Like a sub hobby of the overall hobby you know, kind of under the whole video game collecting umbrella. Over here, there's always been sealed and graded video game collecting, and it has always been a lot more expensive than your average enthusiast who purchases cartridges or even complete in box games. Like he said, in 2017 there, that Mario Bros sold for $30,000. That was just a raw copy on eBay. That was before Wada Games, it wasn't even VGA graded, and you know, it didn't make the extreme headlines, but at the same time, you had those same channels and enthusiasts and personalities in the hobby still talking about that $30,000 sale saying, oh, this is incredible, this is insane, people are stupid, bubble pop, blah, 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 blah. So the numbers have changed, yes, but the sentiment kind of hasn't. Uh, there are obviously more investors and speculators as you get up to these insane numbers of millions, hundreds of thousands, whatever. Obviously, the normal person can no longer purchase them. But even back in 2017, I couldn't afford a $30,000 video game. It was still investors, speculators, hardcore enthusiasts that were making those purchases. 
Now, before we get into the specific details about how this entire racket works, there are some concepts that I want you to be familiar with so that you can better understand the context. The first is the difference between the intrinsic and extrinsic properties of an object and how they relate to perceived value. As I literally intrinsic said, intrinsic. Lie within the object itself. For example, if we were to examine a painting, the intrinsic properties would be the materials it was made of and also, of course, how the painting actually looked. The extrinsic properties would be the relationship the artwork had with everything else. I have not seen this already, Zaylord. When it was painted, the context in which it was painted, and how sought after the piece is, are all important qualities. When it comes to perceived value, it is the extrinsic qualities of a collectible that raises the cost significantly. Van Gogh paintings often sell for tens of millions of dollars. But if we were to program a robot to paint an identical piece, it wouldn't be worth much more than Yeah, the I already pre-watched the video and, the and have my talking points Ultimately, and jokes scripted. Both pieces would look the same on our wall. But us weird and wacky humans like to care about the details that don't directly impact us. We are even willing to spend millions of dollars more than we need to because of these details. In the 17th century, during the Dutch Golden Age, an event happened known as Tulip Mania, where the price of tulip bulbs reached insane levels. At the time, tulip bulbs were a luxury item that were highly desired for their intense colors. And as their popularity slowly increased over the years, the price inevitably went up. Eventually, people began noticing the trend of rising prices and started to speculate on the market. Speculating means buying a good is it almost time to like stop the whole tulip tulip bulb um parallel with collecting and asset classes? It feels like where you get, you know, that was like what the 1600s with the tulip bulb mania. I get that it provides some basis for talking points or seeing what happened in the past, but surely, surely we can all agree at this point in time that what happened with tulip bulbs and what is happening with comic books, trading cards, houses, collectible stuff just has different intrinsic elements to the actual items. You know, at what point does that um, parallel just no longer hold weight in the real world? Good, not due to need, but purely in the hopes that the price will increase so that you can sell it at a later date for profit. With investors beginning to flood the tulip market, this began a positive feedback loop, driving prices up even more. As the price increased faster, not wanting to miss out on the opportunity, even more people started buying in. This caused the first recorded speculative bubble in history. And there are two important things to know about these types of bubbles. First, no one buying actually wants tulips. They just hope to make money. And secondly, this process is not sustainable and eventually people stop buying and the price crashes. Those left holding tulips lose everything as their value Yeah, only once the market normal. crashes, I, I feel like you can get into that talk. Because the exact same thing is happening with video games right now. But the difference is that this current video game bubble isn't an accident. You see, if you know how speculative bubbles work, you can theoretically create them at will. All you would have to do is raise the perceived price of a good quick enough so that speculators see the trend and start entering the market. <laughs> then you can just sit back and let the positive feedback loop do Hey, the 18 work. May, were you just Profiting waiting for Beanie Babies? officially created bubble by buying games early and selling later is rather obvious. But there are actually smarter ways to make money, ways that incur far less risk. In the current video game market and the collectible market in general, there are two institutions that stand to gain the most from increasing prices. Those are grading companies and auction houses. A grading company is a business that inspects games, certifies them, and gives them a rating of quality. They are basically quality assurance. They allow buyers to know exactly what they are getting, which enables quick and easy transactions. In a bubble, people are flocking to get their games graded in the hopes of profiting from the increasing prices. But it's not just the extra business that helps grading companies, as they also take a percentage of the market value when grading a game. A game worth $10,000 might cost around $400 to have graded, but if that exact same game was valued at $1 million, it would cost over $20,000 to have graded. It's a pretty good deal. But the institution that really profits the most by far is auction houses. Take Heritage Auctions for example, which is where all of the current record-breaking video game sales are taking place. 
they charge a 20% buyer's premium on every sale. So if you buy a video game for $1 million, you need to pay the auction house $200,000 on top. And just for shits and giggles, they also take 5% from the seller as well. You can begin to see why grading companies and auction houses would really want prices to go up. It's in their interest. This is also why grading companies and auction houses should never be speculating on the price of goods or impacting markets directly. They have a huge conflict of interest. And whenever you see a grading company or an auction house talking about how valuable games are, you know it's because they want to drive prices up. In fairness though, right? Like, yes, the auction house does take that 20% from you, but that is, um, like everyone bids knowing that. You know what I mean? That's not really a hidden fee. It sucks for you to use an auction company because if you want to go sell something to an auction company, you're basically gonna lose like 30% off the top of your um, selling fees. But if I'm buying from that company, I already know that 20% exists. It doesn't really hurt me as the buyer because we're all bidding under that same assumption. We all know the 20% exists and we're all capping our bids at that plus 20% point. It hurts more for the seller who doesn't see any commission off of that extra 20%. So that Mario sold for 1.56, the, the person who consigned it would receive um, their commission off of 1.2 million and then lose another 10% off of that price. So yes, it sucks. And obviously, you know, auction houses want to get rich off that stuff, but it, it's no one is, um, no one is being tricked by that, I guess is what I want to say. Again, you will need to keep all of this in mind. I'm going to provide you with a ton of information and I'm going to trust you to connect the dots. If you are really interested in learning what's going on, I suggest writing down details as we go or watching sections more than once. Let's begin. Man, I've been playing for weeks now and I've made hardly any progress. Oh, this is Nat. I was like, what the fuck is this? To raid Shadow Legends. Yeah. Your boy can't afford YouTube the Premium. We get ads. The that you will become very familiar with are Water Games, the video game grading company, and Heritage Auctions, the auction house. Water Games was founded in 2017, but it didn't officially launch until April of 2018. Water Games is the linchpin behind this entire bubble, and the certification that Water provides is the justification for why they are sold at such high prices. Interestingly, Water wasn't the first video game grading company to exist. In fact, the Video Game Authority, aka VGA, has been grading games since 2008. But the introduction of VGA didn't cause a bubble like the introduction of Water Games did, and the reason is simple. VGA didn't manipulate the market or go out of their way to create a bubble. The same can't be said for Water, however. I do the agree with that. The president and CEO of Water Games is Dennis Kahn, and he is a key player. The other important company, Heritage Auctions, was founded in 1976 by Steve Ivey and Jim Halperin. Steve Ivey isn't very important to this story, but Jim, on the other hand, is critical. Heritage Auctions are in the business of selling rare collectibles and memorabilia. They sell coins, comics, art, anything you can collect that has value. And in 2019, they started selling video games. But not just any video games, only games that had been graded through WATA Games. The interesting thing about the relationship between WATA and Heritage is that it seems to have existed before WATA even began grading games. On the initial website of WATA, when it launched, it had a dealer spotlight section where it listed key relationships. One was Heritage Auctions, where it stated that WATA certified video games will be featured in Heritage online auctions. This doesn't make sense. The entire point of certification is to guarantee authenticity and quality, but a guarantee is worthless if you haven't established a history of accurate work. Why would Heritage Auctions, a prestigious auction house, agree to sell games from a company that hadn't graded a single game? Why would they trust a business that hadn't even done any business to begin with, when there was already an existing grading company that had been grading games for 10 years? The only explanation to me is that Heritage Auctions was involved in some way in the creation of Water Games and knew that it was on board with their mutual goals. And if you needed any further evidence of this pre-existing relationship, Jim Halperin, the founder of Heritage Auctions, was listed on the Water website as an advisor. Another business that Water had a relationship upon creation was Just Press Play, a distributor of used video games which was founded by Zach Geig. 
Just press play also announced that it would be selling water. So this company games. I do not know. Now, of. in order to create a speculative Never heard bubble, of just press you need play. a way to spread information very quickly. You need to draw in new eyes and to make potential buyers aware that a market is building. The easiest way to achieve this by far is to create headline worthy events that can disseminate through the media. In this case, it was the purchase of a Super Mario Brothers cart for $100,000 in February of 2019. Before this sale, the previous most expensive video game ever sold went for $30,000. So this new sale was a pretty big deal, big enough to generate headlines. But the even more interesting thing is who bought this game. It was purchased by three men. The first was Jim Halperin, founder and chairman of Heritage Auctions. The second was Zach Geig, founder and owner of Just Press Play. The third was Richard Lecce, who has one of the largest video game collections on the planet. Heritage Auctions then issued a press release about the sale. Because of course, the purchase was never about collecting the game, it was about publicity. And if this wasn't obvious enough, Jim Halperin advertised in this press release that the game may end up in a future auction. Dennis Kahn, CEO of Water Games, also chimed in, stating, quote, Water certified video games have been selling for record prices ever since Heritage began auctioning them in January. While many video games sell regularly for five figures, breaking the six-figure mark shows that the hobby's upward trajectory indicates no signs of slowing down. So what you have here is the chairman of the auction house buying a game for a record price and then creating a press release about his own purchase in which himself and the president of the grading company are stating that the value of games is going up. He then advertises that his own game will be going up for auction in the future through his own auction house. And his plan worked. The press immediately jumped on this, and many articles about the purchase were written. Khan's tactic of pumping up the perceived value of games would be seen in every article. For example, in a Kotaku article, Khan states, I've always said, video games are going to go the way of comics or cars or coins. It's only a matter of time until a video game sells for a million dollars. In an Ars Technica article, both Khan and Halperin were again pumping up the perceived value of games, with Halperin stating, There are bets on what will someday be the first million dollar game, and many collectors believe that this will be the one. It's so strange to me that news articles allow the owner of a game to advertise that its worth is 10 times what they paid for and not a single eyebrow is raised. If media and shit are going to Dennis or Jim and asking their opinion on this $100,000 sale, what the hell are either of them supposed to say or going to say? Should any of us be surprised that, yeah, Dennis is going to say that video games should be more expensive when I run a company dedicated to grading video games? And same with Jim, he runs the auction house to sell the damn games. But yeah, I'm not denying that what they're doing is pumping it. It's just like, what do you think they're going to say if a media outlet goes and asks them? The thing about Dennis and Rich Lease is at the core of who they are. They actually do care and love video games. So I guess I sort of give them a pass. Yeah, like Dennis has been in this whole thing for much, much, much longer than Wada Games. Like him and Kenneth Thrower becoming the owner and grader of... Wada Games is why they were accepted immediately by so many high-end collectors is because Kenneth and Dennis were so already established in the video game collecting world. And it's about the sale. They even took the cart onto porn stars, claiming it was worth a million dollars. This, this was the biggest was form the of bullshit that they ever did. Established Wada Games as the authority in grading. Despite if you want to talk about actual manipulation, this was a hype beast move BGA by Wada Games. Porn stars even had Dennis Khan come on, and again he pumped up the value, implying that it was worth at least three times what they paid. Remember what I said about grading companies. They shouldn't be manipulating the market and driving up prices. Dennis even faced backlash about this from intelligent collectors. As he should have. knew what he was up to. But of course, this didn't stop him. He went As the owner of Wada Games, like, yeah, he shouldn't be the fucking expert going into something like Pawn Stars to pump the value of the items. There, there's no defending that. On porn stars multiple times, valuing games at insane prices. 
I can give you dozens of examples, but the point is that there was a very large, very effective campaign to establish Water as the authority on video games despite having only been created. It was critical that Water was seen as the be-all and end-all in video game grading because then the words of its CEO, Dennis Kahn, would be more effective in increasing the value of games. Is that Dan Riga right there? continue to abuse his authority as the head of Water Games for the next few years, appearing in countless articles and interviews, and always pumping up the price. In fact, he's still doing it, even with the ridiculous price of $1.5 million that the recent Super Mario 64 went for in July. In a Verge article covering the record-breaking sale, Khan states, I think that we are going to continue to see record-breaking sales. Again, this is purely to make people believe the price will continue to go up in order to fuel speculation. D-Rob I meant, not Dan Riga, I meant D-Rob, sorry. But it's only one half of the equation. You also need people to actually buy games. But the people buying these games aren't who you'd expect. If you thought they were video game collectors hoping to complete their collection, you'd be wrong. Let's take a look at who is really buying up these games. Collecting has taken an interesting turn in the past few years. Over the last decade or so, I've been a big fan of watching collectors' videos on YouTube, where they proudly show off what they've amassed. In my experience, genuine collectors love sharing their prized possessions, but that's not what we're seeing with these record-breaking sales. Nowadays, the buyers of these expensive games are hidden from the public. Identities are kept secret, and no one takes credit for anything. It's all really strange. Heritage auctions will never tell you who the buyers are, or even if money was actually exchanged. However, there are ways we can tell who bought some of the games, and this is where things get weird. Several weeks ago, I was investigating the relationship between Water Games and Porn Stars, given that the original appearance of Water on that show was obvious collusion between the grading company, the auction house, and the show. In particular, I was researching the appearance of a Mike Tyson's Punch-Out that Dennis Kahn valued at $80,000. Through a Google search, I found something very interesting. It was a purchase agreement of the exact same cart. The owner of the cart, Brian, had sold it to a company for the exact same amount that Dennis had valued it at. The buyer was RSE Archive, LLC, which trades as Rally. Rally is a platform that allows investors to buy and sell equity shares in collectibles. To put it simply, people can buy a fraction of a video game, and if the price goes up, they can sell their slice to someone else in order to make a profit. It's essentially gambling on the price of collectibles, and it's as silly as it sounds. None of the people who buy equity in any of these collectibles actually own it. It's purely to try and make bets on the price and earn a quick buck. The purchase agreement I found for the Mike Tyson's Punch-Out was an SEC filing. Companies that hold these items and sell equity in them need to disclose their assets to the SEC, so we can track exactly what they buy and how much for. There are three fractional share companies that have sprung up in the past several years that are selling equity in video games. Mythic Market So is he saying that Brian went on to Pawn Stars with this Mike Tyson's game, asked 40k or 80k on Pawn Stars, but the item was actually already owned by Rally, and they were going to purchase it for 80k already? Is that what I'm understanding? Yeah, Rally is a fine idea in theory, right? Like, yeah, you can fractionalize shit. With crypto and NFTs and all this other blockchain tech, we can make other shit fractionalized and make the friction between buying and selling and owning these pieces of pop culture, whatever you want to call them, Historia, sure, right? that you can have a piece of Amazing Fantasy 15 without having to actually own it if you want to speculate in that stuff. You think he used the show to promote and potentially pump the asset prior to selling it to Rally. But let's keep going. Otis and Rally. Each of them was formed immediately following the launch of Water Games. Through their SEC filings, I can track their purchases. Rally bought a Super Mario Brothers for $140,000 in 2020. This was the same cart that would eventually be sold for $2 million just this month. From Heritage, they acquired this GoldenEye for $22,800, this Grand Theft Auto for $13,200, and this Donkey Kong for $38,400. Mythic Markets also bought this Metroid for $46,800. Otis also bought a Mike Tyson's Punch-Out for $130,000, 
From Heritage, they bought a Pokemon Yellow for 78 grand, this Golf for 18,000, and many other private purchases. Aside from these fractional share companies, we can also see people buying games from Heritage and trying to flip them on eBay. That is really example, interesting that all the fractional Mario share companies. For 84,000 in September of 2020 is now sitting on eBay with an asking price of 1.5 million. I haven't heard of a single legitimate collector buying any of these expensive games. It's entirely speculation, purely for profit. But there have been attempts to fool the public into believing that actual collectors are buying these <laughs> games. And one of the It's a little bit bullshit to just filter eBay to highest prices and, and then scroll meaningless listings. Like, yes, people do collect sealed video games at that price point, at those 40 to $100,000. Yeah, you have a different market than you do at the underside, but. But yeah, so far, nothing that we don't really already know within the sealed video game market. If you participate in this market, you're probably aware of a lot of this shit. I didn't realize, however, that Rally was purchasing so many of those Heritage Auctions items and that you could actually track them back to either Rally, Otis, or the other one. The biggest cheerleaders for this fake narrative is Eric Nyerman. In 2019, a slew of articles sprung up about a video game collecting dentist who bought a million dollars worth of video games. The original article was posted by the Washington Post, but if you know the real story, this article is insane. It describes Eric Nyerman as one of the world's most avid video game collectors, but in reality, he had only been collecting for several months. He began only in 2019 at the beginning of this bubble. There are many people who have been collecting games their entire lives, but this man comes along and he's instantly the most avid collector in the entire world. The article claims that he bought the games, but this is also not true. He wasn't even using his own money. The money was put up by a group of investors, not by Eric Nyerman. The article becomes even more suspicious when Dennis Khan again rears his head to hype up the market. Heritage Auctions also shows up advertising that the market is increasing. Eric makes his intentions clear by stating his opinion that video games should be selling for millions, which of course would benefit him greatly after his purchase. So why is the Washington Post and many- <laughs> I mean, at least Eric was very, um, blunt in his, yeah, no, they should be more expensive. I mean, in fairness to Eric. It is funny that after he spent, like, obviously, right, we, Eric is in the community. It's funny that after he did spend that million dollars, he was seen as an expert in the field. That is a little bit funny to me even as well, how that all played out. But that, that lasted to today. Eric is, you know, whether you like it or not, a face of the sealed video game, collecting, investing, speculating scene. Yeah, he invested money to make money. That, that's exactly the other news outlets touting Eric, who only entered the video game market in 2019 as the forefront of collecting. Why is it falsely stating that he bought the games when it was actually an investment hedge fund? Why are Water Games and Heritage Auctions always there to give their opinion on the market? It's because this is not news, it's propaganda. Eric Nyman is part of the small group of people at the very top, building this bubble in an attempt to make money. He is a talking head with one purpose, to trick people into believing the video games he owns are worth millions, which he will then sell. He can be seen alongside people like Dennis Khan, always attempting to inflate the market. This was a terrible and interview. This isn't a secret. He admits what a garbage interview that freely. was. Really. Of course, that same week I discover on Heritage Auctions vintage video games, which I never knew, even knew existed. And then when I like, when it played through in my head, I'm like, oh my God, this is like so much better than cards and my, for me. I mean, also it was a new and emerging market. Like you guys are having with NFTs. It's that excitement of like, wow, if this even catches up a quarter of to where cards have gone, you know, we, we could, we could see hundred X returns just at the beginning, you know, cause it was so new, but as a, as a, as a collectible investment, this was like everything that I was, I saw on a Mike Trout card, but like to the max on steroids and. For me, it was a time machine. It was literally like, if you if you could like, sh I always said to myself, I would look at like Nat Turner's collection on of of cards on Instagram at that time, and I was like, wow, if only I could go back ten years and just like hang out with him and just buy everything he was buying. And you know, it's that time machine that everyone has. You guys have it with NFTs. It's always that if I could go back, I could be a billionaire, right? So I said, this is my moment that I'm going to go back in time but it's going to be today and I'm just going to just go for it. So we, we set up, we, we spent time, we set up an LLC, we, we, we made a business plan. Um, and I went to like just neighbors of mine, family, friends, all like successful, wealthy people. 
we, we, we spoke about all the risks and the benefits up front. They knew it was speculative. And I'm like, listen, they're, but they all said the same thing. They're like, you seem super passionate about it. If I lose 15 grand on you, it's not the end of the world. Give it a run. Well, to show even on heritage auctions, eBay auctions, look, we already, what we spent appreciated 20 to 30%. This is working. I'm going to get out there and I'm going to, I'm going to help make the market. I'm going to let people know about this. I'm forming a market of, of around something that I feel that is severely underappreciated. Um, so that's what I was doing. My point is that it's not collectors that are buying any of these games. It's purely people with a lot of money trying to scam other people out of theirs by manufacturing a bubble that otherwise shouldn't exist. Propaganda isn't their only weapon either. It gets much worse. We will now enter the wonderful world of shill bidding. Okay, so I actually had never seen that interview there with Eric, where he um maybe your son made his intentions very clear. I guess you could say, right? I, I don't think Eric held anything back. Like you know when Carl says like, okay, Eric is pumping this market, right? He is um he invested in it, he believes in it, he's gonna speculate in it. No one is being scammed out of their money though if they choose to try to ride a speculative wave upwards. You know when like. Like people want to jump onto a cryptocurrency trend or whatever the hottest thing is. If you decide to spend your money that way, if you want to try and jump in on something like that without knowing the players involved, have they really been scammed or is that person just kind of, um, for lack of a better word, an idiot for dumping money into something that they really don't see the whole picture of what's taking place? You know, if you're going to go and listen to Eric's opinion and on that, dump money in, where does the responsibility of the people putting their money into this market lie? It's really easy now to say, right? Oh, Eric bought all this shit and manipulated it all. And, you know, it all went up and he's just trying to. What if it failed? <laughs> what if Eric threw his money in, he threw in his million dollars and all of this went to shit and none of this market existed? Right? We, we, we would be laughing at him. We'd all say he's a fucking idiot. Yeah, sure, it all worked and the money went up, but we only get to see that because it did go up. Okay, well, let's keep watching. Let's keep watching. I, yeah, I'm commenting on little bits and points in the video. Let's see the whole overall story here. When it comes to auctions, there is only one thing that will consistently drive up the sale price of goods, and that one thing is competition. Obviously, if there is only one bidder, the price will never go up. You are not going to bid more if you already have the top bid. But if two or more people are duking it out, that's where the price can really shoot up. Shill bidding is the act of placing fake bids in the attempt to raise the price. Usually, this is done in collusion with the seller, because the seller wants to make more money for the item they are selling. So they will work with a third party, who will keep placing fake bids up to an agreed price. At which point, they will concede and let the victim win the item. But it isn't just sellers that have motive for this kind of practice. The auction house itself has just as much to gain from inflated sale prices. If your auction house sells goods at higher prices than your competitors, people will want to sell their items through your auctions. And this is where we come back to heritage auctions. In 2008, a lawsuit was filed against heritage auctions for shield bidding. It was filed by Gary Hendershot, who was a former employee. The lawsuit alleged that Heritage used a shill bidder by the name of N.P. Gresham to drive up prices. This lawsuit was ultimately settled out of court, so you may or may not want to put any real stock in it, but it is something to take notice of. Especially when Jim Halperin, one of the defendants, and if you remember, one of the investors who bought the record-breaking Super Mario, was caught lying in a sworn testimony. He originally claimed that M.P. Gresham didn't exist at all, but later had to admit they in fact did. If this lawsuit was the only claim of shill bidding, I might be less inclined to believe it, but the story doesn't end there. While I was researching for this video, I spoke at length with Pat the NES Punk, who is one of the most dedicated collectors of NES games there has ever been. He told me he was contacted by a comic book collector and seller whose father not only worked at Heritage Auctions, but was also friends with Jim Halperin. What he had to say was shocking, and Pat graciously connected us so we could talk. The collector, David Wilson, who founded and runs Collectors Comics, told me this. Hi, my name is David. I'm from uh, Comic Book Investments um, on YouTube. My dad, uh, big time comic book dealer in the 80s and 90s, uh, he ended up taking a job with Heritage a couple years ago. And he had a personal relationship with Jim. And they had a personal relationship for years. And then through the relationship, that's how he got a job working at Heritage. He was a comic book grader. 
he worked for Heritage for almost two years. And during that time at Heritage, he had a few conversations with Jim. He told, my dad told me, because I would talk about the video games, I was like, hey, dad, I can't believe the video game sold for so much. He was already gone by the time the video games have reached where they are now. And he told me, he's like, yeah, so they're manipulating the market. And my dad gave me an example. Jim is one of the biggest comic collectors in the world. He has one of the biggest collections in the world. Just huge. And what Jim does, and this is what my dad said, he would take a comic book. Let's say he would take this book, right? He put it in his collection. And then like three, four years later, he'd throw it up on Heritage. And then he would manipulate the price by bidding it up. So say he bought the book for three grand forever ago. He throws, he throws it in a Heritage auction. And then he bid it up to, say, like five grand, six grand, buy it from himself, basically. He bids it up. And then he sticks it away back in his collection. And then every couple of years later, three, four, five years later, whatever it is, makes its way back into the heritage auction, does it again. And what that does is it stimulates the market by pushing it up, propping it up higher than it is to show like, hey, there's been a sale of this comic book or video game for this price. So that means it must be worth that much. And that's, that's kind of like what I have a feeling that they're doing with video games. They're propping them up like super high, higher than they should be to create a market, manipulate the market into thinking that these video games are actually worth this much because they have sales data to prove it. Yeah, if that's taking place, we can all agree that that's complete bullshit. I think that is actually illegal, is it not? That type of uh, shill bidding and purchasing, is it, I don't know if it's illegal, but... Yeah, that would be pure manipulation, pure bullshit. Far more than Eric or Dennis or anyone in an article being like, oh yeah, no, games are underpriced. Against the law, could go to jail. Yeah, okay. I wanted to make sure it was actually illegal before I said it was. I didn't want to just say it was illegal. If this is true, and everything I currently know about Jim Halperin leads me to believe it probably is, the tactic definitely works. When items are sold at higher prices, it raises the perceived value of every similar item. It's even more effective if you purchase items at record prices. Every time a video game sells higher than ever before, the internet is flooded with articles advertising your auction house. For over two years, all we ever heard about was all of the insane prices that games were going for on Heritage Auctions. Naturally, this makes people want to sell their games through Heritage as opposed to anywhere else. But with all of the reports of shill bidding, reports of buying their own items, and the intense secrecy of purchases, we don't know if Heritage were involved in any of these record-breaking sales. This is why we also can't be sure of the recent $2 million purchase from Rally, as again, the ridiculous price, the secrecy, and the obvious motive make it very suspicious. Jim Halperin isn't the only major player that seems to be using his own platform to personally benefit. It's time to take a closer look at what are games, and how some of the key figures in that business are using their positions for their own gain. No, I do agree that the people with serious money should definitely take this serious. If you are spending, you know, even five figures on this shit, yeah, you should take this seriously. How does this burn anyone but speculators mostly? If it's higher than you'd pay, you're not gonna pay that. Does that not seem like the most obvious answer right there? Like, if you don't want to pay a certain price on an item, then how is anyone getting fucked over except for people who are willing to pay these prices? I, it's going on false pretense is what is happening, which I understand. But the easiest answer is to just not follow the hype train. And it's human behavior, right? Everyone buys into GameStop when it's going up or Bitcoin when it's going up. It's just, it's a crazy thing. It's crazy. Shield bidding and buying your own items at inflated prices are pretty obvious ways to abuse your position at an auction house. But how could you take advantage of your own grading company? The first thing that comes to mind would be grading your own games. This presents a pretty clear conflict of interest, and even Watter admits this. In a New York Times article, Watter president Dennis Kahn goes on record to say that Watter employees are not allowed to have games graded by the company, or sell those that were. I'll say that again. Water employees are not allowed to have games graded by the company or sell those that were. This makes sense, and I applaud that rule if it's actually upheld. Now let's take a look at a transaction that occurred in 2019 between two gentlemen. 
The first is Dane Anderson. Dane is the founder of Nintendo Age, which hosted the largest community of retro video game collectors and enthusiasts Rip on the Nintendo internet. Age. It also contained the most valuable database of information concerning retro games and what they were worth. If you wanted to know anything about collecting, this would be your first place to go. Dane was also well known- If none of you guys use Nintendo Age, if you're too new for Nintendo Age, truly it was a haven of information. It was everything for video game collecting, especially sealed game collecting back from the years of like 08 to 20, when did it get bought? Like 17, 18? I'm sure he's gonna say right away. That was the best place that existed for learning about variants, learning about seals, everything. That place was a true gem. Known for his video game collection, and he had one of the largest assortments of sealed Nintendo games on the planet. But in 2019, he sold his entire collection to a gentleman by the name of Jeff Meyer, who is the founder and CEO of GoCollect, which is a price guide for comic books. The purchase of Dane's collection by Jeff was a pretty big deal, one of the biggest in history. It was so noteworthy that Water Games even gave the collection a special name. It was called the Carolina Collection, because both men hailed from Carolina. Jeff submitted the games to Wata, who graded them all, and as part of that grading, inserted the name of the collection they were a part of. And you can see this name on the label of the Yeah, this games. whole thing that took Jeff place was... then immediately took the newly graded games so and questionable. started flipping them through auction houses, most notably Heritage Auctions, where the first auction alone produced a total return of over half a million dollars. So why am I telling you this? Well, it's because Jeff Meyer is a director of Water Games. You won't find this information publicly because they keep it a secret, but thankfully the company's SEC filings tell us everything we need to know. According to their own filings, Jeff Meyer is a director of the company. So what you have is the president of Water Games saying that employees are not allowed to grade or sell graded games, but meanwhile, a director of the company is grading his entire yeah, collection. Yeah, I can't defend this grading, that took place at all. Grading it in a special, privileged way by naming it, therefore increasing the value, and immediately selling them through auction houses at insane prices for profit. If the games in this collection were graded just like any other game, there would be nothing illegal about this. However, considering the fact that they were graded in a unique and special way, there is a very good argument to be made here for fraud, especially given that Jeff's relationship with Water Games was never disclosed to the public. But it gets even worse. Jeff Meyer also purchased Nintendo Age, which as I mentioned was the most valuable database for retro video games. Jeff immediately shut it down. He also purchased the website Game Value Now, which is a price guide for video game sales. Hearing about all of this again still pisses me off. You know, <laughs> no matter how much I believe in the market or think it might last or whatever, right? When Nintendo Age got purchased, Game Value Now got purchased, the whole Carolina collection went in. This was truly the most bullshit manipulation, just grimy thing that took place in the market. I don't care about, you know, what's happening now with these crazy prices. If you were there to see this whole takedown take place when we lost Nintendo Age, we lost GVN and Jeff Meyer, Go Collect, the Carolina Collection, that is what makes me the most angry about everything that has taken place in the world of sealed video games. Now, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but on the surface, it appears as though Jeff is trying to own and control the flow of information about the value of video games, which only ends up being more suspicious given his ties to Water Games. Again, another huge conflict of interest. Jeff has never publicly admitted to being a part of Water Games, and the way he talks about his relationship with Water makes it seem like that's intentional. For example, in a blog post he wrote himself about his upcoming video game price guide, Jeff states, Thanks to the great relationships with the awesome folks at Wata Games, he is talking in the third person about a company that he is a director of. The cherry on top of all of this is that when Wata Games was incorporated in 2017, Dane Anderson was the executive officer. So this entire deal happened between two men that were or are directly involved with the company. Dennis Khan obviously knows who the directors of his company are, so it really makes you think when he blogs about the Carolina collection on the Water Games website, but fails to disclose that the purchaser of the collection is a director. And it forces you to think even harder when you realize that at the very same time he is telling the New York Times that employees cannot grade or sell Water graded games. 
that there is a good reason why grading your own games is a big conflict of interest, as the grade is extremely relevant when it comes to how much a game can be sold for. The higher the grade, the more valuable a game will be. There is no better example than the recent sale of Super Mario- It makes me wonder if maybe they went through some kind of loophole where Jeff wasn't officially affiliated with Wada Games at the time of the purchase and sale of the Carolina collection, and then later, once that was all settled, did become part of it? I don't know. It, it, it's, it's all, that, that whole thing, like I said, is indefensible. <laughs> that was the purest form of manipulation, in my opinion. Mario 64 for 1.5 million on Heritage Auctions. Its grade was a 9.8, with an A++ for the seal. It's essentially the highest grading a game could ever hope to achieve. On the same day, another Super Mario 64 was auctioned with an 8.5 rating that sold for only $31,000. That's an increase of 5,000% for a slightly higher grading. This raises another interesting Slightly question. higher How grading is being a ratings? little bit soft there. If you are going to there. spend an extra $1.5 million for a high rating, you'd want to be pretty damn sure that the rating is accurate. Grading companies attempt to make their grading process as objective as possible, but the truth is that they are very subjective by nature. At the end of the day, the grading is given by a human based on their own perception of the game's quality, and history has shown that this perception can vary wildly from person to person. Grading companies have been known to give very different grades for the exact same item, and this has led to a practice called regrading. If someone receives a grade for an item that they believe is not high enough, they will simply take it out of the case and send it back. You have a lot of people playing what I call the crack out game, meaning they get a comic book back. Let's go, Sean! Back CGC 9.6, they think it should be a 9.8. So they crack that baby open and they keep sending it back to CGC, hoping that at some point that grader is either gonna slip up or that grader is gonna get that book and go, hey, you know what? This is a 9.8. They're gonna slap 9.8 on it and they're gonna send it back to that submitter. And that submitter is gonna be very happy because in the overall marketplace for certain books, you go from a 9.6 to a 9.8, you just made a large chunk of money. The average collector, the average speculator, and the average investor out there is overvaluing a lot of these items based on the grade, not realizing that in certain instances, the grade is arbitrary. It is an estimation. It is not an exact science. Shout out to our boy, Sean. Jim, Jim Fresh Sean coming in with the takes. It, it, he's absolutely correct. And that is the game within the game that is played by a lot of these people in a lot of these markets. The regrade game exists. <laughs> if any of you take part in cards, it is so prevalent if someone gets an eight or a nine to just fricking crack that slab out and send it back again. In games, it isn't prevalent so far in the mainstream. I'm sure at the highest ends and higher end collectors are doing it quite often. But yeah, that is the game within the game, unfortunately. And when people want to attack grading companies and say that, you know, it's arbitrary, it's all bullshit, it's made up. When the regrade system exists, they have a lot of legs to stand on. And it's a good reason or part of the reason why I don't chase after items like 9.8 A++. Because at that point, you are... In a lot of instances, only buying the grade on the game, you're not buying the game itself because a lot of 9.6s might become 9.8s and a lot of 9.8s might become 9.6 if you were to resubmit them to the, the company. Regrading fucks up population reports, Tobias. In most instances, people won't actually disclose that they are regrading stuff or breaking slabs. So in most cases, the amount of nines that exist will be higher than, it, the amount of nines and eights that exists for cards will be higher than actuality because a lot of them are cracked and resubmitted and another nine might enter. You don't even need to regrade games in order to see the blatant inconsistency on display with what are graded games. Last month, a Tomb Raider for the Sega Saturn was sold for $12,000 through Heritage Auctions. It had a rating of 9.8 with an A plus for the seal, but it's immediately obvious that this grading makes no sense. The seal has multiple very large holes, which according to the grading system on what in fairness to Carl here, most people within the grading and sealed community at this point are fucking laughing at the A plus seal of quality as well from WADA. It's a joke that they allow large rips and tears and the seal rating has been the most inconsistent thing and most people agree on this. WADA's own website is not allowed for A plus seals, which must contain no holes. The seal also has countless smaller holes, scratches and stains. 
quite frankly, it looks disgusting. And yet, it gets an A+. Disgusting. I've seen seals with B grade that are better quality than this. My point is that video game grading is not a science, and the ratings given to games are not an exact representation of the game's quality. And yet, the rating is touted as the sole justification for why people are spending an extra million dollars on some of these games. It is! Now you understand why it is so important to establish Water as the utmost authority on video games, because it makes their ratings all the more valuable. Now, one final thing before we move on. If you knew you were about to create a bubble surrounding sealed video games, what would you do? Personally, I would start buying as many sealed video games as I could. This is Mark Haspel, one of the founders of Water Games and the current chief advisor. He has been involved in the comic book collecting scene for decades, but was never active in video game collecting. But right around the time that Water was formed, he suddenly started showing up at video game conventions, buying as many sealed games as he could. Not only that, but he would actively seek out and inquire about sealed NES games. More specifically, the popular ones such as Mario, Metroid, Mega Man, Castlevania, CGC? and Zelda. The kind of games we see being sold now for record prices. And remember, this was several years ago. His taste in video games seemed to align perfectly with the same games that would bring the most profit several years later. One collector stated, Mark Haspel was buying sealed six packs from a good friend of mine a year before Wata started grading games. Pat the NES Punk also noticed Haspel collecting games at conventions. In June 2019, I was a guest at a gaming convention. The weekend of the event, I noticed a small group of individuals who were hurriedly acquiring sealed and complete in box games from vendors. At one point, I witnessed an individual who I later learned to be Mark Haspel returning to the WADA Expo booth while holding a stack of NES games. I did find it a little strange but was unaware of any affiliation that person may have had with WADA, so I didn't think much of it at the time. It's obviously not illegal for the founders of Water Games to collect video games, and it's impossible to prove intent, but these examples just strengthen my opinion that they knew what was about to happen, and they were preparing for it. Now, before we get to the conclusion, <laughs> I want to teach you about an event in history that might be relevant to what's yeah, happening Yeah, that right definitely now. sounds like insider the trading there by uh, Mark Haspel. Believe it or not, this kind of crazy bubble surrounding a collectible has been seen before. Not to this extent, but still, this isn't a new thing. In the 80s, it wasn't video games, it was coins. PCGS is the world leader in coin grading, and on its website it tracks something called the PCGS 3000 Index. It's an index of the value of coins, similar to something like the Dow Jones. In the historical chart, you can see a massive spike occurring in the late 80s. After crashing, the price has still not recovered to levels seen 30 years ago, and this is without even considering inflation. So what caused this bubble? Well, according to an article posted on antiquesage.com, it was the development of slabbing and the introduction of third-party certification. Slabbing is where a grading company will take a coin, encase it in plastic, and give it a rating. Two grading companies were formed around this time, PCGS and NGC. The article goes on to state that the arrival of PCGS and NGC changed the industry nearly overnight. Now dealers, collectors, and investors- Sean with Reserved Investments has covered this in a few videos if you guys want more information on that. ...given by the major grading services. If you're beginning to get a sense of deja vu, that's completely understandable. This is literally the exact same thing that's currently happening with video games. The fact that people could easily and confidently purchase graded coins meant that they began to sell more and more. This led to the price going up. Investors began to take notice. And more importantly, even investment hedge funds got involved. Kidder, Peabody & Co, Merrill Lynch, and UBS all created coin hedge funds where they took in money from investors to invest in coins. This expanded the bubble even further. But the thing about speculative bubbles is that they always burst. The price cannot go up forever, and at the slightest hint that the peak has been reached, everyone sells. <laughs> the ironic thing you need to remember is that people who buy collectibles in order to make money never actually intend to collect or keep them. So when the price starts to drop, everyone attempts to liquidate their assets as quickly as possible in order to not lose money. 
the market becomes flooded, but because no one is buying, the price gets destroyed. In the end, it's the suckers that came in late that lose their money. The bursting of the 80s coin bubble was a big deal, and hedge funds were inundated with lawsuits from people who had lost their investments. Merrill Lynch ended up paying back over $20 million to their investors. The FTC even stepped in to investigate what happened, and this is where things get juicy. In the Antiques Age article I referenced, it said that PCGS and NGC were the first third-party coin grading companies, but this is actually false. The first third-party coin grading company was NCI, Numismatic Certification Institute, which was founded in 1984. After an investigation, the FTC ruled that NCI misled customers about the value of coins. I want to read from an LA Times article written in 1989, and I want you to appreciate how amazingly relevant it is today, despite being 32 years old. The article reads, By and large, it's grading and rarity that determine the value of a coin. Rarity is easy enough to establish. Grading is often a matter of opinion. It's for this reason that grading services came into being. Their purpose is to give an impartial rating to a coin, which virtually establishes a particular price. But what happens if the grading service misrepresents the grade of a coin, thereby increasing its value? That's the situation described by Bill McAllister of the Washington Post in regards to a recent decision by the Federal Trade Commission. The commission determined that overgrading coins was a deceptive and unfair act, prohibited That's by huge. the 1914 law that created the FTC. Charged with this practice were two Texas- I didn't realize that was an actual law. Heritage Capital Corp and Numismatic Certification Institute. Also named in the action were Steve Ivey and James Halperin, <laughs> prominent numismatic figures. That's a insane. A was signed agreeing to establish a $1.2 million fund for collectors who purchased the NCI graded coins from Coin Galleries Incorporated of Miami. Heritage, Halperin, those names sound familiar. Yes, it's Heritage Auctions and Jim Halperin. That's insane. In the 80s, they were found guilty of illegally misleading customers about the value of coins and fined $1.2 million. From the 1989 FTC annual report, it states, Numismatic Certification Institute and its principals Steve Ivey and James Halperin agreed to settle charges that its representations and failures to disclose information misled customers to the value of coins certified by the company. An affiliate, Heritage Capital Corporation, also agreed to settle charges that it provided substantial assistance to a coin retailer, certified rare coin galleries, knowing that CRCG was misrepresenting the security and profit potential of its coins to investors. Under the settlement, defendants agreed to a permanent injunction, and Heritage and NCI agreed to contribute $1.2 million into a consumer redress plan for CRCG's customers. Another interesting thing about Jim is that in 1985, he wrote a book called How to Grade U.S. Coins, upon which the grading standards of the two leading third-party grading services No, PCGS I didn't know anything about NGC this, how deep this goes either. Based. Again, these are the two grading companies that Antiques Age cited as the most important factors in the coin bubble. There is a very strong case to be made that Jim Halperin is the single most responsible person for the coin bubble of the 80s. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but it kind of looks like he's doing exactly the same thing again 40 years later, but this time in video games. As I've said before, it's- imp The implication there is that Jim is part owner of WADA, or whatever he is with WADA, started WADA with the help of Dennis, Kenneth, and all the players, and is misleading and deceptively overgrading games. I just want to make sure that that's, you know, where he's going with that. That Jim is making water, having water, grade games higher than they are while establishing, you know, them as the market leader and everything. And then also hyping up markets and buying their own stuff. So overgrading games, buying the shit, and then being the leader. Is that everything there? Yeah, I know he's not, yeah, Thane, he's not directly involved with water grading, but if WADA knows that Jim has items coming through, or Jeff, for instance, or anyone else connected to WADA, it would be very hard for them to, um, you know, they could easily overgrade the items or give out more 9.8s, more, or whatever, right? That, that coin connection is fucking huge, though. That stuff about Jim that I did not know. A lot of that stuff with WADA games and the Pawn Stars, the manipulation connections, Jeff, Nintendo Age, Go Collect, 
all of that was pretty well-known stuff, but I didn't know that, that about the coin stuff. We do know who did consign the Mario 64, and he did say he was paid. This is true. Whether or not the sale was bought by Rally or Otis or Heritage themselves, we don't know. But we do know the person who did it has been paid. Let's finish up the video here. Possible to prove intent, but one thing you can certainly disprove is ignorance. Jim Halperin was extremely caught up in the 80s coin bubble and was so responsible that he was fined over a million dollars. You don't forget something like that. He knows exactly how bubbles are formed. He's seen them before, which is why he would know exactly how to create them again. Remember, Jim Halperin bought the Super Mario Bros. cart that sparked this entire game bubble. He is an advisor to Water Games and, according to rumors, also an investor in the company. He is the founder of the auction house that these games have been selling on for record prices. It's too convenient that this one person is involved in every single piece of the puzzle when he has the kind of history that he has. This doesn't seem like a coincidence to me. The retro video game bubble cannot go on forever. At some point, it will burst. The question is when. There are a couple of scenarios that might make this happen sooner rather than later. The first is the release of population reports. Collecting, one of the things that drives up the price of an item, is rarity. In every other realm of collecting, grading companies produce what are called population reports. These reports tell you exactly how many of any particular item have been graded by the company, along with their rating. So if I do a search for Action Comics number 1 through CGC, a comic book grader, I can find out exactly how many are out there and at what rating. Population reports are standard practice, because they allow people to judge the rarity of an item accurately and fairly before making purchases. But surprise surprise, Wata Games keeps this information hidden from the public and refuses to let anyone know how many games of each type have been graded. So we really have no idea how many of each game are out there. When more games of the same kind become known, prices plummet. It has already started happening with some games. The best example is Spider-Man for the Atari 2600. In May of 2020, <laughs> the first sealed Spider-Man was listed on Heritage Auctions. It was a 9.8 A++, the best rating you can get. It was mint condition, and it's such an old game that it's surely rare. It sold for $9,000, which in 2020 was actually still a decent amount of money to spend on a video game. But the funny thing about Spider-Man for the Atari 2600 is that it's not rare. It's not rare at all, even in mint condition. After this sale, Heritage was flooded with 9.8 A++ Spider-Mans. And when I say flooded, I really do mean flooded. With each sale, the price diminished. In April of 2021, a 9.8 A++ sold for $870. That's a decrease of over 90% in less than a single year. When people realize how common some of these games are, prices will be destroyed. I have to feel like Carl literally took my whole, um, my pop report video there for the Spider-Man, that he loved that example and ran with it. I, I, I that is too coincidental. Destroyed. And that's what Water Games and Heritage Auctions are afraid of. Legitimate collectors have been <laughs> complaining for the past- <laughs> Let's go! Let's go, Greg! two years, but unfortunately, none of them have substantial audiences, and they are essentially powerless against the forces that are driving this bubble. If you want to help I'm powerless boys. change, you can send What A Game some feedback by email, letting them know how appreciated it would be if they let us know how many graded games are out there. The release of population reports would be a good start, but What A Games and Heritage Auctions also need to stop manipulating the market with their propaganda. Journalists don't even bother asking real collectors what they think about what's happening. They simply get sound bites from Water and Heritage and allow them to inflate the bubble with hype, despite the obvious conflict of interest. I asked a couple of lifetime collectors what they think should happen, and this is what they had to say. My name is Pat Contry. I'm a YouTuber, podcaster, but also a longtime video game collector since the late 90s. I've seen a lot of things in the game collecting world, but what's happening right now with the graded sealed games market is something I could never, ever imagine. And it's a shame that the video game collecting hobby that I've been a part of for decades and many others, including uh, sellers as well, people that have helped 
grow this hobby of ours with passion, with knowledge, doing research, putting in the time and effort, this is the end result. The unfortunate end result is that this hobby that we all love has been perverted. It's been twisted to the ends of a small group of people to line their pockets. These are rich people getting richer and they've stepped on and stepped over all the video game collectors, all the people that have sold the games, run video game shops, all the people on forums researching this illustrious uh, and beautiful past history of video games, they've all been used. We've all been used now for the select few individuals to get richer. And it's a crying shame. It's probably too late, unfortunately, but in a perfect world, there should be full transparency and accountability when it comes to these video games. We should know if someone who helps run the auction house. I don't think Pat Collect sealed it all. No. In the buying and selling of the games that are being auctioned, we should know if the people grading the games are buying and selling these games themselves. It's unethical if they are doing so, and we should know that so we can stamp out bad behavior. Now, how can this be avoided? Well, it's quite simple. If WADA would release and update population reports for all these items that they're grading on a regular basis, this would not be a problem going forward, guys. This is a problem due to the fact that there is a lack of ethics and a lack of transparency in these markets. Collectors deserve better. You guys out there that want this to be a thing, rather than thinking from the standpoint that you're going to make money over the long term in this market, what you should be doing is demanding better from grading companies, from auction companies, from other players in the trade, you should be demanding ethics and transparency. This bubble isn't just affecting sealed video games at the highest price points. The With that, right? Like population reports wouldn't just remedy everything taking place though. I, I don't want, you know, I even made a call for population reports that would help with certain shit. It would help with certain mistakes that are being made and help people to make certain better decisions. On that same principle, though, population reports would also lead to a lot of fuck-ups the exact same way that not having them does. Because if they drop, say, and let's say, um, I don't know, any game, insert random NES game, and it shows, oh god, there's only one of them that have been graded. Maybe it's like Winter Games on NES, right? There's been one graded. Will that cause a market frenzy to something like that where, well, maybe there's only one graded because people haven't bothered to submit it for grading yet? It's kind of like how people, um... Mario Bros. 3 is going to be one of the most common graded games on NES at this time. Yes, it does have a higher population, and a population report would show that, but in the three years that WADA has been seriously grading games, the ones that are going to be graded are the ones that have market demand at this time. So, population reports aren't just going to come out and completely remedy everything, and prices will go down, and that'll save us all. It will help, it'll cause certain things to correct, but it will also cause its own vast amount of shakeups. It's better to have that transparency of the report so we can all act on equal basis, but population reports aren't just some amazing remedy. I just want to put that clear. When, VG, when CGC starts grading stuff, they won't have population reports. They absolutely will not. They still don't have population reports on cards, so... Really, WADA is the only company, VGA as well. You could expect WADA and VGA, hopefully, to put them out eventually, but they aren't just going to be some godsend that collapses the market or saves the market. The selling point of every single game has increased dramatically over the past two years, even for non-sealed games. Aspiring video game collectors who legitimately want to build their collections will get screwed because the hobby will become too expensive to be viable. What's worse is that people are using the record sale prices in order to scam people. You can find get rid of this Super shit, Carl. Come on. For hundreds or even thousands of dollars. No on one's eBay being scammed by this dumb shit. Ten bucks. People with a lot of money and power have taken over collecting, and their thirst for money means we will all suffer. As someone who does care deeply about gaming, it honestly sickens me that these people have turned these cherished possessions into a means to gamble and speculate. And I hope this ridiculous practice of trying to extract profit from the suckers who buy the hype will end sooner rather than later. As a sign of appreciation, it would be amazing if you could go and subscribe to a couple of real collectors that helped me learn more about this.
go check out Pat the NES Punk. Please mention Greg. From Please mention Greg. These two gentlemen have been collecting for most of their lives. Fuck's sakes. And we need more people like this who are not only passionate, but are willing to tell the truth about what's happening. Also check out David Wilson's channel as it really took some balls no to respect. be willing to let me know what he had heard. You can find the links to these channels in the description. Hopefully, you have learned something. Get the Grand Games is also pretty cool. Maybe you should check bubbles. out his channel. Next time you see them trying to do it, make sure you call it out and let them know that we won't tolerate it. As always, thank you so much for watching, you legends. I hope you are having a fantastic day, and I will. That was a fantastic video, video, though. Wow, like that actually was fantastic. Um, <laughs> if you enjoyed that kind of content, go and subscribe to Carl because yeah, his videos are always this level of high quality. Powerful video, a masterpiece and informative. It is, it's super informative, Blitzkrieg. I, absolutely it is. Like I learned shit in there too that I did not know prior to watching this. <laughs> it doesn't really change my view on anything that's taking place because a lot of the people who are buying and into this, I'm, oh, I mean, maybe I'm over speaking there. I like to think a lot of the people who are buying into this market, especially at the 30, 40, 50,000 mark, understand the type of bullshit that has taken place to get us to this point. I guess that's what I want to say. Not that I think this is all going to crumble. It's all a scam. There are no real collectors. There are no people with interest. There are. I don't just see that we're ever going to collapse to a point of pre-2019. But... If it is in fact true that they are shill bidding their own stuff or creating these false headlines, then yeah, we can expect a market correction to happen. Of course we can. I mean, I've put out the warning before that you should never participate in a market like this if you can't accept that type of shit happening. You jump into a market like this because you are drawn to the 10 times gains. You are drawn to these massive market movements. If, if you also can't accept the risks of it, you shouldn't be in it. Not to say what they're doing is fine or anything. That is a totally different. Just if you are going to enter this market, you have to be ready for that type of shit to happen. The rug could be pulled out from under you and it could happen very quickly. Yeah, it'll damage their per reputation and perception to the general public, but not to the most of the buyers who are going to purchase from Heritage Auctions anyway. That's, I guess, the biggest issue. The people who are purchasing from Heritage are the same people who, are, who know a lot of this shit. If, if it helps even a few people, these deep-pocketed investors, save money, I guess, or, you know, not get scammed out of something, then that's great. As much as I don't want to see anyone lose money on false pretense, I also am very, very big on taking self-responsibility if you're going to participate in a market like this. So, even if this is all propped on false pretense and bullshit, if you jump into this market... It's your own fault for wanting to speculate in something like this. You wanted this type of gain. You wanted this to be real. I'm huge on taking, on taking responsibility for actions rather than saying I got tricked, I got scammed, I got... I, it does happen. It does happen. I get that. Just I'm on such a self-responsibility level that it's hard for me to say... Oh, you jumped in because you thought everything was only going up and then it didn't? Oh, man, that sucks. You know what I mean? Maybe that's a hot take. I'm not sure. Not sure if that's a hot take or not. Yeah, I, we all do want the hobby to be healthy and real. And, you know, I would love for all this to actually exist. I really, really would. But obviously it's hard to put complete faith in this when, you know, we have all this shit taking place. There's no doubt about that. You know, being propped up on bullshit and then getting taken advantage of from that bullshit, obviously nobody wants that. That's not what anyone's looking for. But it's really hard to... It's hard to stop it now that it's in motion. You know, obviously this video that Carl made is one of the best things to help us now get this type of information to the mainstream and maybe people can make better decisions. But it's just shitty that we're now here. The fact that the Heritage Founder uses his own auction house to sell his games is a real problem that seemed to get brushed aside over some of the other issues at hand. Yeah, that is the biggest issue, my biased opinions. If the Heritage Founder is indeed selling, shilling, buying and selling his own game multiple times, 
you know, that is the biggest bullshit that is taking place. The coin thing was insane. I agree with that. I didn't realize how deep Jim went with all of the, um, with other manipulation practices prior to that. I didn't realize that. That's the most dangerous claim in the video. It's also one of the few in the video that weren't completely unsubst- that were completely unsubstantiated. Don't think that's a coincidence. That's what I mean, Diddles. Um, I agree with you. <laughs> If we can't actually prove and verify that Jim might be doing this same shit again, obviously it's a highly coincidental thing that, you know, could be easy to link this. But it is speculation at the end of the day on that. Yeah, collecting is a lot of dopamine hit. That is 100% unicorn. I agree. A lot of it, especially when the prices are going up. When we're collecting and prices are going up this quickly, that is a massive dopamine hit. If any of you guys have participated in cryptocurrency, I'm sure you can relate to buying crypto and then literally just staring at your phone and seeing what it does over the next minute, 10 minutes, hour. And you you literally rise and fall with the ebb and flow of the crypto. None of this is going to stop me from grading. I'm probably sending next week, to be honest. That <laughs> Zylotic, I agree with you 100% there. That is the thing. The people who are already using WADA and having fun with it and being part of it, um, they're going to keep using WADA. A video like this is only going to really turn off people who already weren't using the service, in my opinion. <laughs> you think as this market has exploded, all the great stuff has or is coming out of the woodwork, especially sealed NES. Some of those titles only have a few known sealed, and Pop Report will show that. Agreed, Brian. I don't think, um, I think this video with Carl here did a little bit of hyperbole as well, talking about how common some of this shit is, where if you are actually involved in the sealed games market and have been collecting sealed games for a while, you know that shit like, um, uh, hang tab Mario Bros. So I think it was a fourth print that sold. That, like, that, that stuff isn't going to have high population counts. Whether you care about, whether you care about nuance with condition or variants like that, that, that's your own thing. But, if that is where the high end of collecting goes, objectively, those will not have high population counts. Those items are rare, especially in very nice condition. Water grading just went down the toilet. It's worth nothing after this video. <laughs> Chaos Dimension. Tomorrow, same time as this, we have a live auction feed of Heritage Auctions and their weekly signature or their weekly auction where we can literally see if this will have any effect at all on the market for sealed video games. We might see immediate effects. Maybe next week we'll see effects, but we are going to watch the Heritage Auctions tomorrow and see what happens. I don't think it's going to have nearly as much of an effect as the larger collecting populace thinks it will. In before you steal some auctions? That's the thing is there's so many people who actually watch the Heritage Auctions. There are so many people in sealed game collecting, graded game collecting, who are literally waiting for this magical bubble burst or this market collapse that... If prices were to start dipping even 20, 30%, they would get scooped up immediately by all these people who have been waiting for a dip. But even if that happens, it can't happen if everyone's watching at the exact same time they're hoping these items dip. Is VGA accused of any serious manipulation or just WADA? Bouchard, VGA has no presence, no transparency, and no public people, so you can't manipulate anything if you never talk to anyone. If a lawsuit comes or people start going to prison, you'll see a correction. Yeah, that's exactly Blitzkrieg. If an, if an actual lawsuit happens, or if Heritage and Wada find themselves on the end of a lawsuit or any of that shit, that's when we all need to start panicking about the market, because I think something like that would lead to a, a correction, if you want to call it that. A market crash, so to speak. But even then, I think it would get scooped up, but understanding the actual nuance of sealed games or why we're collecting sealed games. And it's a thing of even if you don't agree with sealed games, if you think it's stupid, if you think it's not worth what people are paying, it's the understanding that, yeah, these are a lot more rare than actual sealed games. And it just, it's, it's extremely different. It's extremely, extremely different than CIB collecting or, you know, I don't know. Whether or not you'd like to participate in that market or you believe in that market or you want to take part in that nuance, that's all up to you, but it's understanding the nuance that does exist. Like I said in the video, I don't like to pay 9.8 or even a lot of the times like PSA 10 premiums because the PSA 9 can be had so much cheaper for a collecting purpose, but when you're going into that investment speculating realm, People want the best. They're going to speculate on the best. They're going to invest in the best. If you're getting into that kind of market, I pray that you at least know what the fuck you're doing. 
you know, you can say that everything is stupid or everything is ridiculous with sealed games market, but you have to at least understand the fucking fundamentals of it and the inherent rarity of the items being traded. It just isn't even a uh, normal or uh, uh, you your opinion shouldn't hold any weight, I guess, is if you're going to compare it to the cart only market or even the complete in box market. You are just not even talking about the same hobby at that point. There's the sealed collecting hobby, like sealed and graded, and then like the rest of the hobby. And it has always been that way. And for some reason, a lot of people think that it's the same hobby and it just really isn't. Yes, there's spillover effects from sealed that go into the uh, complete in box grading. That happens, yes. But the cart only collection or even your average kind of shitty condition CIBs, they're not going to move much. That spillover effect is just more coming from... That, that spillover effect is more so coming from other collectors in that realm buying out other collectors in that realm. It's other gamers forcing other gamers to pay more. As much as people like to think there's some kind of altruistic nature behind true collectors or people who collect a certain way or I only play physical games. If you are buying shit from the market and collecting in the market, you are inherently taking away from the supply pool and causing price increases. That's just how it works. There is no... Uh, like, you know, when he talked about all video games have gone up. Well, COVID in 2020 was a whole other beast. We can't even mention video game prices going up because literally everything went up. So that was a long rant. Did the video change the way I'll approach collecting? It didn't for me, GG, because I already act. Um, I said it in a different video that I act on a what do I stand to lose, right? What is the downside of every purchase I make? I, I'm not in this really looking for upside potential or massive gains or anything. So if I see something where I'm like, no, I genuinely do not believe in this item at this price, I will not speculate, I will not invest, I will not collect it. So I'm very um, careful in what I buy and where I buy and why I buy, because I want to try and avoid this kind of downside risk as much as possible. You had to wait years to get some sealed PS1 games in good condition. People think they're common because they're used to seeing open copies for cheap. Absolutely, that that's, that's absolutely right. Look at like, you know, games like Crash Bandicoot, Tomb Raider, those games that are selling for these high ass amounts. Um, I know people who have chased after them who said waiting for one to come up, especially waiting for a high grade one to come up, has taken a lot longer and been a lot harder than people expected it to be. Now, does that mean that maybe someone's holding all the sealed Crash Bandicoots in three years, we're going to see a whole dump of them into the market? Maybe? But like, shit, these games have always been collectible. It's not like this is just gonna come in nowhere. Are gonna come out of nowhere, you know? <laughs> Dennis, Jeff, and Dane. Thanks for entertainment, guys. Hanging out on the yacht, enjoying ourselves. Retirement at 30 is nice. That's actually fucking hilarious. I think it's fair to say, though, since gaming is only gonna grow and stay relevant, hence collectibles become rarer. Well, yeah, Petros, if you believe in gaming and their historical relevance and people wanting to collect it, if you believe in it, there is the argument for the market continuing on stronger in the future than it is now, even if a correction or some bullshit takes place. Do I expect any sort of statement from WADA or Heritage? Based on everything I've seen from cancel culture, um, the best thing they can do is ignore it. I think that is the best thing Heritage and WADA could probably do is ignore the whole video. And I don't mean that that, you know, helps the market, is good for the market, is helps anything. I'm just saying from their standpoint, I think they'll ignore it. I think that is probably the best option. Goodwill listed that Zelda under Nintendo 64 and pulled it the final day of the auction was sitting at 26k. Oh, yeah, okay, Brian. Yeah, I remember you showed me that, that it was listed as N64 and just a... Uh, just a shitty listing altogether. I remember that. Yeah, Eric likely wouldn't have seen it had it not have been relisted. I'm really interested to see. Um, I'm interested that who or who tipped them off that it was completely under or, you know, screwed up and messed up. Yeah, I think they'll stay silent and ride it out. I know you don't collect modern, but first print Rocket League for Xbox One is really rare as a modern sealed. Is it actually Matt McRae? I remember seeing, it's like a hollow foil cover, I think, right? Um, 
Xbox One though? Ah, isn't Rocket League? Did Rocket League not make it on 360 late? I honestly can't comment, Matt. FF12 2, a Nintendo DS grade 9 sold 530 on eBay, and the PS2 FF12 CE 90 plus sits on eBay for over a year for 600. The Nintendo DS game is 35 raw. Why? S Block? Pfft, you got me, man. You got me. I know FF12 Collector's Edition has been, you know, really common for a lot of years, but like, pfft, got me. It was discussed on a Facebook group, which he is part of, so he probably saw it there. Ah, didn't see that blarky. Yeah, great, great video. Great video, great Carl Jobs video. If you like his stuff, go uh, subscribe to it. All the videos are that high quality. And um, yeah, I will talk to you guys later.